Hello, everyone, and good evening. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Spencer Rukti. I'm the author events manager here at Third Place Books in Seattle, Washington. On behalf of the bookstore, I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's presentation uh, by Emily Levesque at this week, uh, as this week marks the paperback release of Dr. Levesque's book, The Last Stargazers, The Enduring Story of Astronomy's Vanishing Explorers. So first of all, I want to invite you to use the chat window at the bottom of your screen and say hello and tell us where you're calling in from. And secondly, I just want to add that through virtual events like tonight's, uh, Third Place Books is really fortunate to continue fulfilling its mission of connecting readers with authors in community spaces. Uh, we do sorely miss having authors in our stores, but at the same time, we're very thankful for the miracle of virtual events that brings our event series into your homes all across the world. So thank you for tuning in and for supporting independent bookstores. Uh, we are proud to host a number of exciting virtual and in-person events later this season, uh, which you can find on our website, thirdplacebooks.com, uh, where I also encourage you to sign up for our email newsletter for the latest on our author event series. Uh, I'll be posting a link to that in the chat later in the evening. As I mentioned before, the chat window at the bottom of your screen is open, and we encourage you to use it respectfully. Um, Tonight, we will also have some time for your questions. So if you have questions for our author this evening, you can please submit those to the Q&A window, uh, which is separate from the chat window at the bottom of your screen. We also offer closed captioning for those who are interested. You can just hit that live transcript button at the bottom of your window to turn this feature on or off. And without further ado, uh, I am pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Emily Levesque is an astronomy professor at the University of Washington. She has observed for upward of 50 nights on many of the planet's largest telescopes and flown over the Antarctic stratosphere in an experimental aircraft for her research. Her academic accolades include the 2014 Annie Jump Cannon Prize, a 2017 Alfred P. P. Sloan Fellowship, and the 2020 Newton Lacey Pierce Prize. A world-renowned speaker, Dr. Levesque's pick, uh, lecture at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics about the weirdest stars in the universe has been viewed over two million times, and she also teaches a 24-lecture course series entitled Great Heroes and Discoveries of Astronomy for the Great Courses. The Last Stargazers, which is Dr. Levesque's uh, first popular science book, was called Witty and Honest by Science Focus. And Zenger News uh, writes that this book is worth recommending to anyone who ever saw a constellation, an eclipse, or a shooting star and wondered about giving chase. And I love that beautiful quote. So with that, uh, I am so pleased to be watching along with all of you tonight. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Emily Levesque. Hi, everybody. And Spencer, thank you so much. And thank you so much to Third Place Books for hosting this virtual event. I'm Glad we're all able to get together safely these days and to talk about some great adventures of astronomy. So I will go ahead and share my screen and tell you a bit about the stories and adventures that you can find in The Last Stargazers. So as mentioned, this is my first popular science book. Um, I am an astronomy professor at University of Washington. I've written academic books and I've had a wonderful career in academic research, but this was my first foray into the world of publishing. So when I wrote my book and started the process of getting it published and advertised, I got to attend a lot of a handful of excellent publishing events before everything went virtual. And at these events, I got to serve on panels and talk to other authors and talk to people in the publishing industry about what it's like to write a book. And a lot of people were talking about the beautiful phenomenon of first lines of books. People were talking about iconic first lines that they remember, so things like It Was a Dark and Stormy Night or Call Me Ishmael. They were talking about the first lines of their own books and how they agonized over them. And it got me thinking, well, okay, I'm writing this book about what it's like to be an astronomer, what it's like to explore this amazing world of astronomy, and how do I welcome people to this very unusual, exciting world of exploring the universe. What's the opening line of my book? And I realized the opening line of The Last Stargazers is, have you tried turning it on and off again? So it's a little less sweeping universe adventure. It's a little more phone call with AT&T, but this is actually one of the most petrifying things that's ever been said to me at a telescope. And it kicks off the opening story that I tell in my book. 
Somebody said this to me while I was sitting here. I was a graduate student observing with the Subaru telescope atop Mauna Kea Observatory in Hawaii. And in the middle of my night of observing, when I'd been granted precious hours on this telescope to observe distant galaxies for my PhD thesis, the telescope and the computer that was running it, which had been running along just fine, suddenly made this awful blunk noise over in the corner of the room. And I looked at it, and then I looked at the only other person on the mountain with me, who was the telescope's operator. She looked back at me, tried to figure out what made the blunk sound, and then reassured me with, no, 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 it's okay. I think the mirror is still on the telescope. And this wasn't the reassuring comment that I think she hoped for. I hadn't realized that telescopes' mirrors could fall off. But it turns out that that alarm had warned us of exactly that happening. To explain a little bit about what I mean when I say the telescope's mirror, Subaru's mirror is a little over eight meters from end to end. For some scale, that's me standing beneath another telescope that's also a little over eight meters from end to end. So you can see how enormous these telescopes' big main mirrors are. That mirror is what collects all the starlight that these telescopes study from far off the, on the other end of the universe and is the main sort of tool for gathering this light and gathering this data. When we design a telescope, the primary mirror is the most important mirror, but it bounces light off of what we call a secondary mirror, which is sitting at the top of this screen. This is another illustration of a telescope interior. In this case, the primary mirror of this telescope is sitting at the bottom of the screen, and there's a secondary mirror suspended high overhead. When a telescope is observing, starlight will come in, it will bounce off the primary, it will bounce up to the secondary, and the secondary will then send the light into a camera or some other scientific instrument so we can study it. That blunk noise had warned me that the mechanical supports holding up Subaru's secondary mirror, the one suspended, you know, several dozen feet in the air, had failed. That meant that if we tipped the telescope even a little bit from side to side, the mirror was at risk of not staying on the structure. It would slide off and go crashing dozens of feet to the concrete floor of the telescope. And that's if we were lucky. If we were unlucky, it would hit the big main mirror on its way down. So this was what that alarm had meant. And we put in this very nervous call to the engineering crew that helped run Subaru Telescope. And they very calmly informed me that, oh, this probably wasn't a problem. This was probably just a false alarm, and they probably had a way to fix it. They kept saying, probably, it was not reassuring. They said, you know, this would probably be fixed if you just turn the telescope off and on again. And I was not on board with this fix. I treat my modem like that. I don't really do that to scientific instruments the size of a building. And I was then sitting there as a 24-year-old grad student deciding what to do about the largest telescope on the, this largest piece of glass on the mountain potentially being broken. And all I could think of was stories that my colleagues had told me about times when telescopes had almost broken. The one that kept coming to mind was one that didn't almost break. It broke in fairly spectacular fashion. This is a radio telescope in Greenbank, West Virginia, that during a night of otherwise utterly normal observing went from this, this sort of standard satellite dish type structure that we see in telescopes like this, to this. The telescope underwent a catastrophic collapse. It was utterly destroyed and they had to build a completely new telescope in its place. At the time, sitting at Subaru, I couldn't remember what had caused this problem at Green Bank. I was pretty sure someone had tried turning it off and on again. So I sat there faced with the idea of maybe this is a false alarm. Maybe if I turn it off and on again, I'll be able to keep observing. I'll get precious data for my thesis. Or maybe I'll be wrong and I become the grad student who broke the biggest piece of glass in the world. So I had no idea what to do. And this is the story that I wind up using to open The Last Stargazers, because it's a glimpse into the sort of startling and nail-biting situations that we can sometimes find ourselves in while working at these beautiful telescopes and trying to answer questions about the universe. When I tell people what I do and when I talk about astronomy, Nope, I don't have to sell anybody on space being cool. Everybody loves space. Everybody loves these beautiful pictures that we get from observatories like the Hubble Space Telescope. We love the sparkly stars, the really cool nebulae. We like thinking about black holes or aliens. It's easy to get fascinated by the mysteries of space. But what fewer people know about is what 
the job of studying the universe is actually like. We may love astronomy, but we don't necessarily know a lot about what astronomers actually do. If you try to picture a professional astronomer, you tend to picture something like this. You picture a man, usually he's got a beard, he's wearing a lab coat for some reason, and he's standing next to a little telescope on a tripod and looking through it with his eye. It's a completely fair picture because any of us who have a backyard stargazed or who have gone to an astronomy open house at a school has probably done something like this. You sort of imagine stargazing as a hobby, but writ large. This was certainly the best picture that I had of astronomy when I was a little kid. I was interested in space starting from a very young age, and I have proof. This is me when I was six, proudly wearing my Hubble Space Telescope t-shirt. Hubble had launched earlier that year. I knew that space was cool. I knew that being a scientist sounded awesome. I had decided I wanted to be a scientist, and I had no idea what that meant. Nobody in my family was a scientist. I didn't know any professional scientists. I just thought that studying the universe was cool. The best glimpse that I could get of what professional science was like came from the movies that I grew up on. And what I learned from these, I mean, what I learned from Twister and Jurassic Park was that if you're a scientist, you spend a lot of time with your research chasing you. Um, even from Contact, I got the impression that astronomy was pretty great, but I knew even as a kid that you probably didn't discover aliens every day. So this was as much as I was able to learn about the job of a scientist until I got to college. After my sophomore year at MIT, I got the chance to do a summer research project in Arizona. I traveled to very southern Arizona, south of Tucson, and went to Kitt Peak National Observatory with a research advisor of mine, Phil Massey. And this was the first time I'd ever been to a real professional observatory, and the first time I'd ever gotten to use one of those telescopes for a potential research project. So Phil brought me to the observatory. We walked into the cafeteria at the observatory where people would eat their sort of strange night schedule off-shift meals, and we wandered in at a about dinner time before people would head to the telescopes and start observing. We sat down with a group of people who all seemed to know Phil, and he introduced me and said, hi everybody, this is Emily, she's a student working with me, and this is her very first time observing. And when he said this, the whole table got so excited and said, oh, welcome, you're gonna love it, it's so cool. Now, remember to order your night lunch, the meal that you eat in the middle of the night to stay awake. Order your night lunch, but don't eat it too early. You'll get hungry at 10, try to hold off until midnight. And remember to drink coffee, but don't drink coffee after about three in the morning, or you won't be able to go to bed at the end of the night. And then someone else said, you know, look out for scorpions. We have scorpions around here. And there was a woman once who had a scorpion climb up the inside of her pant leg while she was observing and sting her, which is true. And then someone else said, oh, that's nothing. I know a guy who was observing in the dark and had a raccoon crawl into his lab and he just pet it until it went to sleep. And then someone else says, well, I know a guy who was in a dome when it got struck by lightning. And someone else says, hey, I know a story about a telescope that once got shot. And these stories started pinging around. And I was sitting at dinner with my fork sort of stuck halfway to my mouth, and I couldn't decide if I wanted to sit there all night and just listen to them tell stories, or if I wanted to run off to the telescope and start getting some stories of my own. And it took me a little while to realize what that bout of storytelling had actually been, because I've heard my colleagues do that over and over through the years. These stories were a way of welcoming a new person to the field, of seeing somebody new to astronomy and saying, here's a little glimpse of what this wacky job is actually like and the adventures that you might have in store for you. So years later, the memory of that storytelling scene and the memories of the stories that they had shared and the glimpse they'd given me into the profession that I was about to enter, that's what wound up making the basis of my book, The Last Stargazers. So this book gives people a behind the scenes tour through the adventures that we have as professional astronomers. It was an Amazon Best Book of 2020. It's been a finalist for some science writing prizes, including writing prizes aimed at young adults. It's a book with adult, young adult crossover appeal. If you're interested in learning more about it, I know Third Place Books is selling copies tonight. And you can also follow news about it with the Last Stargazers hashtag on Twitter or Instagram. Now, writing this book got to take me on some pretty great adventures of my own. 
I had visited a number of observatories for my research, but I went back to a number of them as a author and as a journalist trying to gather stories from my colleagues. I got to visit observatories in Hawaii, in Chile. I got to visit the Gravitational Wave Observatory right here in Washington State. I got to fly on a telescope that operates out the open back door of a plane, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Out of all of these, though, my favorite experience was actually this picture on the lower right, which is my trusty little voice recorder that I used to interview all of my colleagues for the book. Now, I'm not a trained investigative reporter, so I was learning how to interview as I went through the process of preparing this book. I mainly learned that you want to let people talk and listen and see what sorts of stories they tell. And I largely wanted my colleagues to share their own personal memories of working as astronomers with me. But there were a few questions that I liked to ask everyone. And these questions are what I'll be focusing on for the rest of this talk. The first question that I really liked to ask every single person I talked to was, what is your most memorable second or third or 10th hand observing story? Lots of people told me about their own adventures, but I wanted to know the stories that they had heard someone tell someone else once at a conference sometime, and the story was just so wild that they had to share it. The stories that were, you know, sort of half true and tall tales and kind of entered the legendarium of our field. I wanted to track down these iconic stories, get to the truth of them, and make sure that they were included in The Last Stargazers. And I got two answers from people over and over when I asked this question. The most common answer, most definitely, is one that I've already mentioned. Everybody asked me some version of, do you have the one about the telescope that got shot? This is a true story. It has evolved into all sorts of untrue forms in our field. But the true tale of this is that there is a telescope in Texas at McDonald Observatory that has the unusual distinction of being shot. Now, the backstory to this is that this telescope had a 107 inch primary mirror. I showed you the big primary mirror that I was standing underneath before. We describe these mirrors based on how big they are because that directly tells us how powerful they are, how much light they can gather. When this telescope was built with a mirror that was 107 inches from end to end, it was one of the beautiful state of the art telescopes in the country. Now, unfortunately, at McDonald Observatory, there was an observatory staff member who, because of an unfortunate mental health incident, one evening became hellbent on trying to destroy this 107 inch telescope. In the middle of an observing night, he went charging into the telescope's control room, brandishing a handgun. He pointed it at the telescope operator and demanded that the telescope be lowered so that he could fire bullets into the mirror and destroy it. The operator lowered the telescope. Fortunately, nobody was injured in this incident. And then the gunman fired six bullets into the primary mirror. Now, it sounds like this would be completely tragic and the mirror would just be completely lost. But I showed you that picture before. Telescope mirrors are enormous and they're very, very thick. When the 107 inch telescope mirror was made, these mirrors were absolutely enormous. If you have a Pyrex dish or something in your kitchen that you bake with, you've seen close to the kind of glass that we use to make telescope mirrors. And in a telescope mirror, that glass is about a foot and a half thick. So if you imagine a foot and a half thick Pyrex dish and then imagine firing a bullet into it, those bullets stuck into the mirror, into that glass like darts in a dartboard. They just sort of went pink and stopped. Not very much happened to the mirror at all. You just sort of wound up getting a few tiny little holes in it. The gunman was underwhelmed by this. He then took out a hammer and started trying to destroy the telescope that way. At this point, he was safely subdued and taken away. And then the observatory staff had to assess what the problem was and see what might have happened as a result of a telescope mirror being shot. And they saw this and they thought, well, you know, that, that, that's not that bad. That could be worse. We can just dig the bullets out. And really, instead of a 107 inch telescope, we've just lost a little bit of space on the telescope. It's more like 106 inch. It'll be fine. They were actually able to keep observing with the telescope like this. And to this day, when that mirror is taken out to be refinished and resurfaced, you can see the bullet holes from the incident. The only problem is that word of the incident got out into the broader community. And the sound of a telescope being shot, this story, made it really seem like the mirror had been destroyed. So the observatory's director had to put out an announcement 
to the whole community. He used an announcement board that typically says things like, we found a new Nova in a nearby galaxy. Somebody should really follow that up. Or somebody discovered a variable star. Let's talk about it. So in the midst of all these kind of dry scientific updates, a post was shared saying, yes, our telescope got shot, but don't worry, the harm from the bullets was extraordinarily small. It has to be one of the most unusual posts that's ever been shared in the field. So this is one of the wacky stories that gets shared around the community just because it sounds sort of absurd. But what I kind of like about this story is that to really understand it, you have to understand some details about how astronomy works. You have to understand the importance of that big main mirror collecting starlight and understand why we would call a telescope like this the 107-inch telescope. You'd have to understand who that telescope operator was that got threatened at gunpoint to lower the telescope and understand what telescope operators do. You need to understand how big and thick that glass is and understand why the bullets didn't shatter it, and you need to appreciate how rare telescopes like this are. Research grade telescopes are very precious commodities. We have only a few dozen of them on the planet. At the time that this incident happened, we had even fewer. So it helps drive home the stakes of potentially destroying an amazing building sized scientific instrument like this. So this was by far the most infamous story that people related to me. And it was one that I was very glad to track down the true version of and include in the book. Another story that a lot of people brought up was another thing that they'd have remembered. They would say something like, you know, there was a radio telescope, I think it was in Australia, and it detected these weird bursts of radio light, and they thought it was space, and it wound up being something funny. What was that? So this is another true story that happened at Parkes Observatory in Australia. So this is a radio telescope. It's designed to detect light that is not visible to our eyes, but that nevertheless carries really important information about everything from black holes to dying galaxies in our universe. This telescope in 2007 detected this really brief, weird blast of radio light. Nobody knew what it was. It struck them as very odd. Usually you sort of detect a constant or a neatly varying source of radio emission. You don't get this burst of radio light that just appears and disappears. Nobody knew what that was, and for years it was sort of set aside as a funny puzzle. In around 2012, an astronomer named Emily Petroff came to work at Parkes Observatory and was really interested in studying like brief bursts of radio light like this event. She told people she was interested, and the observatory immediately said, oh no, don't bother. We've actually detected those a lot since then. We don't think they're real. We think there is some source of radio interference somewhere on the ground, and we're accidentally picking that up. We don't know what it is, but it can't possibly be interesting. Don't bother. Emily decided to get to the bottom of this. She wasn't convinced that all of these really were just a electronic device on the ground going haywire. She thought there might be some real science buried in this, but in order to study it, she had to explain where all these strange bursts were coming from. The observatory had actually nicknamed these bursts peritons. This is a mythical creature that looks like one thing but casts the shadow of something else. It's something that's disguised as science that turns out to be something a little more pedestrian. So her mission was to decide where the peritons came from. She wound up enlisting the help of the entire observatory staff. In the end, um, the, her scientific paper on this has every staff member at the observatory as an author, including sort of cleaning staff, front office staff, because everyone wound up participating in this hunt to explain where, where the weird radio bursts had come from. Their first hint came when they looked at when the radio bursts tended to arrive and realized that these strange events, these peritons, tended to happen around the lunchtime hour. So space is strange. Space does not care what time lunch is in Australia. So this was the first clue as to where this might be coming from. The picture that I have on the screen now is an aerial view of Parkes Observatory, and the arrows are pointing to the various sort of administrative or office buildings in the observatory grounds. All of these buildings have places for people to work and break rooms where people can eat lunch, relax, maybe microwave, some leftovers. So this team started to look at the microwaves as potential culprits. And they explored everything they possibly could about how to get a microwave to make a brief flash of radio light. 
In their research paper, they say more about microwaves than any astronomy paper ever has in history. They describe running the microwaves on different power levels for different durations. They always carefully microwaved a mug of water. Somebody read like the entire manual for a 1970s era microwave to figure out how it makes radio waves but they couldn't make a periton. They would run the microwaves and the telescope would calmly sit there and detect nothing. Someone finally realized that they were doing this like very careful, conscientious scientists. They weren't acting like hungry people waiting for their lunch in the middle of a workday because when you microwave something, you don't patiently wait for the microwave to run down. None of us do. You watch the numbers count down and you see them go four, three, to, close enough, I'm hungry. And you open the door of the microwave, you know you do it, before the microwave has entirely finished running. When they did that, when they stopped the microwave by opening the door instead of patiently waiting for it to finish, they did it. They were able to produce a periton. They went back to the data, they compared the signature of an opened microwave door to all the weird bursts of radio light that they detected, and they were able to explain all of the bursts that they had detected, except the one from 2007. There was a burst in that data set that could not be explained by a microwave, that in fact did wind up being cosmic in origin. Today, there's a whole field of study focused on studying what we call fast radio bursts, these brief blasts of radio light, and we're still trying to figure out exactly where these events come from. But the mystery would never have even started, and this would never have turned into an entire field of astronomy if Emily and her team hadn't started by discovering what microwaves were doing to the observatory. This is the most common version of a story like this that astronomers told me, but people had a bunch. They were telling me stories of somebody lighting a match and having that be accidentally mistaken for a star flaring. They were telling me about gravitational wave observatories that thought they were detecting signals from deep space that wound up being ravens pecking at ice on the observatory walls. The number of stories like this really abound, but most of them tend to happen to radio telescopes. My favorite one that I heard more recently actually happens at the same observatory I showed at the beginning. I showed you that enormous radio telescope that collapsed. The telescope that was built in its place is what you now see on the screen at Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia. This area of West Virginia is an amazing place for radio astronomy because it is specifically built and is specifically restricted to be extraordinarily quiet. This is the United States radio quiet zone. Near this observatory, people do not drive regular cars. They drive diesel cars because the sparks of spark plugs actually give off tiny radio signals. They don't have Wi-Fi. They don't have cell phones. If microwaves are operated there, they're operated in special cages to protect their signal from escaping and messing with radio equipment in the area. So it's an amazing place for radio telescopes, and it's largely kept very radio quiet. It's also in the middle of what you can see as a beautiful natural environment and a beautiful forest. There was a research group working in the surrounding state forest studying the forest population of little flying squirrels. They wanted to understand these squirrels, how they moved, how they um, interacted, and to do this, they decided to track the squirrels' movements by fitting them all with tiny little radio collars, which was adorable, but also made them a swarm of radio noise sources. The observatory described that for a couple months, they basically had to stop operating and just do sort of solve engineering problems because all the telescope detected would be squirrels. They try to go study a black hole, nope, squirrels. They try to study a nearby star, squirrels, distant galaxies, fleet of squirrels. So they had to wait for the little batteries in the collars to die before they could go back to observing, all because of another research project that wound up producing this source of interference. So another question that I liked to ask all the astronomers that I talked to were what they thought would surprise audiences the most about our jobs as astronomers. What was the biggest disconnect between what people think astronomers do and what we actually do? I think the most common answer here was, well, we don't stand around wearing lab coats and peering through the eyepiece of a little telescope. We tend to have some pretty incredible adventures. And I got to hear some amazing adventure stories and even have a couple of my own in the process of writing this book. So these pictures are a sampling of some of the incredible adventures astronomers get to go on in pursuit of our research. Now you'll notice that the guy on the lower right is wearing a lab coat and is standing next to a little telescope on a tripod. He has a really good reason, and I'll get to why what he's doing is such an adventure in a minute. 
This picture on the upper left is an observatory that I briefly mentioned before. This is NASA's Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. It's nicknamed SOFIA. And it does exactly what it sounds like. It does astronomy in the stratosphere. This is a specially modified Boeing 747 that is designed to fly into the planet's stratosphere higher than commercial planes fly and open that rear door that you see in the picture to expose a special telescope designed to study infrared light. Now, normally infrared light can't make it to the surface of the Earth. It gets blocked by all of the water vapor in our lower atmosphere. By flying above the water vapor, this telescope is able to observe light that we would normally never have access to from the ground. I actually got the chance to fly on board this telescope for my research, and as a bonus, I got to write about it for the book. It is the most incredible astronomy adventure I've ever gone on in my life. We flew out of New Zealand and the Southern Hemisphere. We flew so close to Antarctica that we actually saw the Southern lights out the window of the plane. I tell the full story in my book, but it is the coolest thing I've ever gotten to do for my job. Other astronomers that I talked to talked about similar efforts to kind of take telescopes as high above the ground as they could without launching all the way to space. They described building telescopes and building instruments, attaching them to these enormous scientific balloons and launching the balloons from the remote backcountry of Australia or Antarctica. I also talked to astronomers who traveled all over the planet to track solar eclipses. They would have to bring all of their observing equipment with them and get into the path of a total solar eclipse to study things like the outer layers and winds and workings of our sun. I talked to astronomers who spent entire winters in Antarctica working at the telescope built at the South Pole. This telescope is part of the giant telescope network that has taken observations like our first picture of a black hole, but astronomers would have to winter over during Antarctic night, which is a whole adventure in and of itself. And finally, I promised I would explain this picture on the lower right. This is a picture of a man named George Carruthers. He designed and patented the ultraviolet camera, so cameras that are specifically able to detect and focus and capture ultraviolet light. He's standing next to one of the first telescopes that featured his invention, which is a tiny little four inch ultraviolet telescope. Now what makes this telescope so amazing is that his invention and the telescope that he built is the only telescope we have ever taken to the surface of the moon. This telescope was flown to the moon on board Apollo 16. It was operated by astronauts John Young and Charlie Duke, and they got some of the first pictures we've ever seen of stars in the ultraviolet. We pointed it back at our own planet and got to see what Earth looked like in the ultraviolet. It opened up an entire new era of astronomy. Today, when you look at pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope, you see signs of the same types of ultraviolet cameras that George Carruthers originally invented. So this, I think, taking a telescope to the moon for astronomy has to mark one of the best adventure stories that I've heard in our field. I did also get told one story several times from my colleagues here at the University of Washington about an incredible astronomy adventure that happened right here in our state. So the observatory on the screen now is Manastash Ridge Observatory. It's a little observatory in sort of south central Washington that the University of Washington uses as a teaching telescope and has used for things like PhD thesis research. Back in 1980, an astronomy graduate student at the University of Washington named Doug Geisler had a wonderful first night of observing for his PhD thesis at Manastash Ridge on May 18th, 1980. When I tell this story to most audiences, they kind of go, oh, okay, May 18th. And the date ne doesn't necessarily stick in their brains. But when I tell this story to people in the North Pacific Northwest, a few people in the audience always go, oh, because they know what's coming. So Doug had a wonderful night at the telescope and he took the notes that you can see on the upper left in the observatory's night log. It's a way to carefully write down every detail of the night. You can see he says, I observed for 10 hours. I didn't lose any time to clouds or bad weather or a broken telescope. The sky condition was excellent, beautiful night. He writes about a lovely observing night and then describes going to bed. He had a good night's sleep. He woke up the next morning at around noon, ready to start an astronomer's day. He opened the door of the dormitory, expecting to be in the blinding sunlight. He opened the door into utter blackness. 
He couldn't see more than a few feet in front of him. He grabbed a flashlight and the flashlight beam just got swallowed. There was this awful sort of brimstone smell in the air. He didn't have a cell phone to check. He couldn't check notifications for news. He thought he was living through the end of the world. He ran back indoors, turned on a radio, got static after static after static station, and finally found out what had happened. Earlier that morning, Mount St. Helens erupted. Now, the way Mount St. Helens erupted was interesting because basically a side of the mountain blew off. It made for a really unusual trajectory for the volcanic fallout. And what happened is that the volcano was to the southwest of the observatory. The eruption blew a huge plume of ash to the northeast. So after the eruption happened, here's what happened to Doug. The volcanic plume blew straight over Manast Ashford's observatory, bathing him in this sort of sea of blackness when he woke up. Doug, being a good scientist, went to check on the telescope, made sure it wasn't being damaged by the falling corrosive ash, and then noted what happened in the night log. He explained, I lost six hours of observing time. The reason was volcano, sky condition, black and smelly, and then detailed what it was like to be on the mountain during this incident. It has to be one of the most extraordinary stories I've ever heard of Mother Nature and the conditions of our own planet interfering with our quest to understand other planets. And for this reason, the title of the fourth chapter of my book, where I look at the challenges of studying the universe from our own little planet, is titled Hours Lost Six Reason Volcano. So the last question that I asked my colleagues dealt with how astronomy had changed since they began observing. And this was a question that had a fairly uniform answer, but people approached it in a couple of different ways. All of the answers had to do with how astronomy technology has changed and how the tools that we use have evolved dramatically in just a matter of decades. People pointed out how they used to capture astronomical images. They used to, prior to the invention of easy to use digital imagers, take astronomical photographs on glass plates. I actually have an example of a glass plate, if you can look up at my video in the corner, just to show you how tiny and thin these are. I'm holding a piece of astronomical data in my hands. There's a picture of a galaxy that's very hard to see on the camera, but it's held on a sheet of glass that is only a couple of millimeters thick. These sheets of glass would be treated with a special chemical that would darken when they were exposed to light. Astronomers would buy these plates in bulk from a company like Kodak. They would try all sorts of weird chemical tricks to make the plates as sensitive to light as possible. They would bake them or freeze them or rub them with lemon juice. They would slice them down to a size that fit into their telescope's camera. And they would do all this work, remember, in the dark, because once the plate was exposed to light, it would start to darken. They would then carry it out to the telescope in the dark, climb into the telescope themselves, carrying the plates in the dark, and ride with the telescope all night, loading glass sheet after glass sheet into the camera, and then opening the telescope's shutter to expose the glass to light and let it darken until they had a picture of what you see here, a galaxy or a star that they were trying to observe. Now, it sounds like a really arduous way to get astronomical data, and it was. It made for an exhausting job. But you wound up with beautiful pictures like this. You can see the really nice, clear spiral galaxy on the screen. You can see the core of the galaxy, the lovely twisting spiral arms. We were able to do astonishing science using pictures stored on bits of glass. But you can now compare the technology of yesterday to an image taken of this exact same galaxy using the Subaru telescope, the telescope I mentioned at the very start of this talk. And this is the difference of what we see today with modern cameras and modern digital imagers. You can see exquisite detail in this galaxy. You can pick out clusters of stars. You can pick out signs of clumps of dust that are blocking our view and changing the color of the light. The amount of detail that we get from telescopes like this is really just amazing. An example I love showing is what we make possible when we study light at different wavelengths. This is a really cool spiral galaxy observed in visible light, so the same light that our eyes can detect. This picture was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. Now for comparison, you've probably all seen a lot in the news lately of the James Webb Space Telescope. This is the successor 
to Hubble. It's been launched. It's on its way to a point one million miles away from Earth, farther away from us by far than our own moon. And the telescope is in the process of unfolding itself so that it be can begin to observe and operate. You can follow along with the deployment online as it opens up a sun shield to keep itself cold and as it starts to, as it did today, unfold its secondary mirror. Remember that mirror that on Earth would be suspended high above the primary. This, every step of this deployment has gone well so far. There's more than 150 potential ways that this telescope can fail. The secondary mirror deploying this morning was the thing that officially turned it from a space mirror to a telescope. Astronomers on the internet were incredibly excited about this. If you want to just see screaming excited astronomers, go on Twitter and look up anything related to James Webb. But this is why we're so excited. Remember, this is a picture of a galaxy in the visible light detected with Hubble. We've been able to take amazing pictures like this for 30 years. With the telescope like Webb, studying infrared light, light that is a little redder than what we can see with our eyes, we will not see this, we will see this. We get a completely different view of the galaxy. The dust in that galaxy at long wavelengths almost starts to glow. We're able to highlight and study the dust in that galaxy, the very cold stars in that galaxy, old stars, stars that might resemble the very first stars in the universe. We can also get a great glimpse of the background stars and galaxies that you can see in this picture. My favorite example of this, going from visible to infrared light, actually isn't the galaxy you see in the middle of the screen. It's two little twin galaxies that you can see on the bottom of the screen. If you look at the bottom of the image, just to the left, you'll see what looks like a pair of two tiny twin spiral galaxies. If I go from visible light to infrared light, those galaxies light up like a little pair of eyes. What that tells us is that the light coming from those galaxies is very bright and to our perspective, very red. Those galaxies are actually receding from us in the distant universe at such a great speed that their light gets redder. It tells us that those galaxies are far, far away in the universe, speeding away from us as our universe expands. Webb is going to make it possible for us to study galaxies like that and study the very edges of the universe. It's going to be an amazing instrument and there will be much more astronomers celebrating on the internet when it finishes successfully deploying. Another comment that people made about the technology and the thing I want to leave you with tonight is that as the technology for our work is changing, the way that we do our job is changing. This is me standing in front of a fascinating observatory that's currently being built in Chile. This is the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. It's named after the woman who discovered dark matter. And this observatory has a very simple but very beautiful mission. It is going to observe the entire southern sky over and over, taking a picture of it every few nights for 10 years. It's going to wind up giving us a decade-long movie of the night sky. We're very used to thinking of the night sky as something that's fairly static. We see the same stars every night, maybe we see planets moving through the sky, but Rubin is going to reveal to us just how volatile and just how ever-changing the sky is. Every time a star brightens or dims, Rubin will see it. Every time a distant star dies as a supernova and appears as a bright little dot, in the night sky, Reuben will see it. We will see tiny little asteroids scooting through the night sky, including asteroids that might come a little bit close to Earth. Reuben will be able to spot them immediately as soon as they become visible. So it's going to be an incredible observatory, but the way that it observes is a little different. I told you that it's programmed to just observe the entire southern sky every few nights. This is a complicated observing task, and a lot of astronomers are working very hard to make this happen. But it's different than the kind of observing I described at the start of this presentation, where I talked about going to the Subaru telescope with a plan to observe a handful of galaxies, and sitting at the telescope myself and deciding what I wanted the telescope to point to from night to night. We won't get to tell the Rubin Observatory what to do. If a strange supernova happens somewhere else in the sky, we probably won't be able to say, hey, point to that. Rubin Observatory will be executing its pre-planned set of observations. If it finds something strange, we will not have been able to spot that with any other type of telescope, but we'll need to turn to a more traditional telescope to point back at whatever odd thing it's discovered and learn more about it. So Rubin represents an exquisite new step in how we can study the night sky and in how much data we'll have about the way the universe works, but it's going to have to operate among a suite 
of different types of telescopes. This is what a lot of my colleagues pointed out, saying, you know, we used to sit inside telescopes holding glass plates and it was painful and cold and exhausting, but we were there. With the telescope like Rubin, we'll be working in our offices, maybe even in our homes, and get data emailed to us. The access of this data and the power of this data is amazing, but it represents a different type of astronomy. One thing that all of my colleagues said uniformly is that this was an amazing advance in research, but that we needed to keep all the different types of astronomy that I've talked about tonight. We really don't want to be what the title of my book describes, the last stargazers. We want to combine the power of telescopes like Rubin with the innovative ideas of something like Sophia, a telescope that flies into the stratosphere, or the amazing new capabilities of a telescope like Webb, or radio telescopes, telescopes that cover every wavelength, telescopes that can be hand operated to point at something a scientist is curious about, or that can be programmed to to, to generate heaps of data that scientists can then work with. We really need the full range of observing capabilities like this to truly keep stargazing and truly keep doing our research in the coming decades. And those stories and those sort of hopes and imaginings of my colleagues are what I tried to capture in The Last Stargazers. So on that note, I'll put the book's information up one more time. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight and for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks very much. Uh, Dr. Levesque, that was amazing. I had a, such a great time uh, watching you talk about, uh, give us all these stories. Um, I, uh, yeah, everyone in the audience tonight, uh, if you have questions, submit them to the Q&A ch chat in the window below. Um, I do have a question to start us off. Uh, uh, I was wondering, I think one thing that I think people take for granted is that there's so much technical information that you have to translate for, you know, a popular, popular audience for people like myself. Um, and that doesn't, that's not a skill that really comes naturally uh, to ever, any astronomer or scientist. Uh, just people aren't able to do that. These concepts for uh, the general public. Um, so you're, you broke up a little bit, but I think that what you were asking was how do you, how do you learn to communicate ideas yeah, like oh. this to the, yeah, to the public? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, that's it's perfect. Actually, it's funny because it's a skill. I think I think there's sometimes a slightly unfair stereotype that scientists can't possibly talk about science without throwing out jargon and math and equations. And math is the language of science. You absolutely have to be conversant in it and comfortable with it to do it as a career. But we've also gotten a lot of practice, I think especially in astronomy, with communicating our ideas outside of our immediate specialty. Um, if I was talking to another scientist who specializes yeah, in dying stars, which is what I do, I can use a lot of jargon. I can sort of leave blanks that they can fill in. But that also lets me not quite, that lets me sort of skip parts that I should be able to understand and explain in detail. When I talk to a colleague that studies planets, I use different language. When I talk to my students, I use different language. When I talk to a group of eight-year-olds, I use different terms. And a lot of scientists wind up developing this skill because it's how we communicate what we do. Um, I think it's a crucial skill for us to have because so much of our research is taxpayer funded. So much of our research is really yeah. fascinating and wacky, but out there. And being able to share with people why it's interesting and why it matters is critical. Um, a lot of us just get this with practice. Um, I don't know how many of your audience members are local to Seattle or local to an area where these sorts of things are done, but during non-COVID times, um, the University of Washington and other universities have events called Astronomy on Tap, where people will actually give astronomy presentations at breweries and will show slides talking about their research while people get to drink beer and ask questions. Um, we have graduate students in our department who are brilliant at this. The program is run by our graduate students, and that sort of thing is a great way to practice talking about your science to a general audience. So I, lo I love chances to do things like that. Yeah, I was going to say, I think actually uh, Third Place Books used to host Science on Tap um, at our Ravenna store at the Cafe Arta that's next door, um, or like conjoined with the bookstore, and that was always really fun. And sometimes, you know, people would have books, sometimes they wouldn't, but it was just like a great reason to like sit around and like watch a presentation and drink, yeah. Yeah. Uh, favorite, uh, question, but favorite, like astronomy or physics documentaries? 
Um, sorry, you br can you ask the question again? Your signal just broke up a little oh. bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, do you have favorite documentary documentaries about physics or astronomy? Um, so yeah, I have a couple. Um, I there's a old um, it's actually not quite a documentary. It's sort of a docudrama or a dramatized documentary um, that I remember watching as a kid called From the Earth to the Moon. Um, it's based on a book by Andrew Chaikin called A Man on the Moon, and it tells the story of the Apollo space program. And that book actually wound up being an inspiration for The Last Stargazers because it told the story of how we put people on the moon, but it did it through the sort of human tales of how people made this possible. It talked about the astronauts who whose names people know. It also talked about the engineers that were involved in building something like a lunar lander, which was a concept that we'd never had to tackle in engineering before. It talked about the engineers that helped run the program and keep people safe. It talked about the scientists who were just dying to get scientists on the moon to do geology or astronomy. And the sort of personal vignettes of that documentary and that book were just perfect for me as a middle schooler saying, oh boy, look at all the people that it takes to make something like this happen. I think there's a place in that world for me. It was a very meaningful way to start connecting to it. Um, in terms of filmed material too, I will take this opportunity to plug my um, Great Courses course. Um, if anybody is familiar with Great Courses or Wondrium, um, I have a course with them called Great Heroes and Discoveries of Astronomy. Um, you can stream it, you can get it via DVD, um, you can also access these from your local library. Um, and it talks about the big astronomical discoveries of the past century along with the people who made them and the stories of these sort of humans behind the science. So if people are curious about sort of some video content dealing with astronomical discoveries and the humans behind them, that's another thing they can check out. That's great. Yeah. When we send out our email with the recording of the events, I'll make sure we'll, we'll plug that as well, because that, that looks like a really wonderful course. Yeah. Um, it looks like we don't have any other uh, questions from the audience. So um, do you have any final uh, words before we wrap up tonight? Um. I, I'm really happy that people were able to come out and join us tonight, even with everything that we have going on in the world. Um, a question that I've had people ask me as I sort of write and talk about this book, especially in the midst of a pretty turbulent time, is, you know, why does astronomy matter? Why do you care about astronomy at a time like this when you're, you know, refreshing case rates and worrying about politics and worrying about a lot of very real, very important day-to-day -day concerns? And the reason that I love astronomy and the reason that I try to share that sort of love and joy with people is because it's one of the best examples I can think of of a world where everybody can sort of share an experience that's positive and kind of triumphant. Um, the pandemic has really been a global event. Mm -hmm. It's something that really unites people but from a place of sadness and a place of you know shared struggles and there's a there's an opportunity sometimes to feel unity in that, but it's pretty sad. And I remember in June of 2020, we had a comet pass very close to, or we had a comet pass close enough that we could get a great view of it from the Northern Hemisphere. It was called Comet Neowise. And I remember seeing it from Seattle and going out to observe it with a couple friends standing in a little cluster six feet from the next group of people who were six feet from the next group of people. But everybody had their phone pointed in the same direction. Everybody had their binoculars pointed at the same thing. And it was this funny little unifying moment, even from six feet apart. And something like getting to go see a comet together or watching James Webb unfold is an experience that, you know, everybody on the planet can share that's positive and that shows how good we are at engineering and how good we are at science and how curious we are about the universe. So I see it as a nice source of familiarity and joy, even when difficult things are happening. So hopefully that's, that's something a, that I can share with people who read it. No kidding. That's a great, great answer. And, uh and a great question and i think it's extremely yeah it's very important i think about in i think it was 2019 that picture of the black hole that uh yeah, or yes. the very first like image of a black hole that was circulated in what an event that was you know pre pre 2020. if i if you remember the picture of all the little minions celebrating that was yeah. the entire astronomical <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. the day we saw a picture of a black i think that picture got emailed more than any other picture has ever been emailed that day that was that was stunning but. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Levesque. This was uh, such a wonderful presentation um, on half of the bookstore. Uh, please be well, everyone, and enjoy your evening. 
Thanks, everybody, and thanks for inviting me. Bye.